This is a tall order. And what I mean by that is this. Every time I come to the collect for St. Luke the Evangelist, whose day, of course, we commemorate today, I feel like it in some ways, it not only lays out something that's important, but it also sort of gently takes me by the front of my shirt and says, come on, you can do this too. What is it? After talking about Luke, the physician, setting forth in the gospel the love and healing power of the Son of God, we pray, graciously continue in your church this love and power to heal, to the praise and glory of your name. In other words, the assumption of the prayer is, is that the life and ministry that we see in Luke Acts is in fact meant to continue in the church of God. And that there should be some genuine parallel that in many ways, in the same way that God by his Holy Spirit acted through his son and through his church, that there would be these same markers of things continuing to manifest themselves in the life of God's church in a way that in fact points people to Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but that was not a part of my seminary training. And quite frankly, especially when I was in seminary, any talk about the healing ministry of the church was either relegated to a group of people that prayed, but not much ever happened. This has changed, but then that was what it was like to be in the order of St. Luke. Or these kind of crazy charismatics that looked a lot more like Pentecostals than they did Episcopalians. And as my mother said to me very pointedly, we are not one of them. (laughs) So I I really had to go on a search to try to see (laughs) what this is and how it works. And I've been to everything from Pentecostal camp meetings, to all kinds of various healing services and ministries in and around the life of God's church, pretty much spanning the entire spectrum of Christendom with the exception of orthodoxy. Not that they aren't open to this, by the way. The other thing that I've had to face is, at least in my training, and really continuing in all different parts of the life of the church, a kind of... Um, incipient agnosticism about this sort of thing. Uh, Most kind of clearly stated in a way that people found appalling, but there was more truth in it than most would admit. From my former bishop, when I was serving in Paoli, Pennsylvania, by the name of Charles Benison, now resigned, who infamously used to say that as he quoted out of context early church fathers and the Bible to spin his own version of the gospel story, when challenged would say, oh, come on, all of us have a canon within the canon, meaning we pick and choose the scriptures that we want to believe and teach and conveniently leave the rest alone. That was one of the things I was very grateful for last night when in the question that was raised about the issue of verbal inspiration and how we deal with that and various understandings, uh, Dr. Anderson was so quick to talk about not letting go of the biblical understanding of that, it, that it in itself is an inspired text, but a way to think about that that made room and in fact painted with inspirational accuracy the foibles and the weaknesses of its authors. I quite frankly, we still play, and to our detriment, a kind of we're not like them. Whether you're talking about those people over there, whether they be within the church or outside of the church, as a way to define my my position. And inevitably, when you are reacting against, no matter actually what it is, it automatically leaves, presents you as too far on the other side. It... In an effort, in fact, to, let me put it another way, in an effort to be balanced, what we wind up being balanced about is our own opinions. Not necessarily the gospel that we are trying 
to proclaim. I get it. It's easier at one level to live with a kind of spiritual reductionism. Because you see, if I don't live in the world as it is described in Luke Acts, packed as it were, with angels and demons and God intervening, interfering, some would say, in the affairs of humanity, I actually have a world that I feel like I can handle. But if I consider the fact that I, mere mortal, born by the Spirit of God, literally live in the midst of a world that I cannot see with the naked eye, that puts me in a whole different place. I think a better place because it drives me to my knees in a way that I think is in fact appropriate to the limitations of our sight. We know in part. We prophesy in part. But given the fact that we have been trained in, as well as, not to mention the world that we live in and around us, deals basically with a world that you can see, rather than a world that we cannot see. It takes actually intentional work to ask God to come in and literally redo my vision, how I see the world. But if I'm not willing to ask God to correct what I believe about the world and my capacity on occasion, though not always, to have the discernment to see into the unseen and act accordingly, you can either describe it as trying to live as a Christian with one hand tied behind your back, or you can talk about it as not having complete information in a way that actually could guide you to make really wrong decisions in the end. So what I really am asking for as I think about this sermon this afternoon is to take seriously a quote from Robert Heaney, who is the Virginia Theological Seminary Director for their Center for Anglican Communion Studies, a missionary in Tanzania at one point in his life before he got his DPhil. And he said quite clearly, mission is in fact not defined by us. Mission is defined by God but to in fact live in a way that somehow looks like God's mission. That means I have to take seriously the fact that as Amos Young, whom I would commend, missiologist professor at Fuller, talks about a spirit-filled cosmos. And think about that in a very practical way in terms of your home, your church, your community. Who's with you when you drive your car? You are not alone. And begin to get used to the fact that you actually have a place in this very alive spiritual universe. And if Lewis, C.S. Lewis is to be believed, a universe more real than the material world that we can see, that might have a tremendously powerful impact on our encounters with, as you rightly said, quoting Lewis again, no mere mortals. Think about it this way. Can we pray into the call to participate into what Paul described today as the ministry of the Spirit which comes in glory without thinking that we are returning to the good and bad stories that came out of charismatic renewal? Now a generation ago, because many of us still are like, you know, we're not like them. And try to really pray into what it means to think about what it means to live in this very vitally, spiritually alive and conflicted planet where God has placed us. Can we not pray into the call to this gospel mission empowered by the Spirit without feeling like we need to go back to seminars and how to develop one's prayer language, or how you too can be slain in the spirit. Charismatic renewal did much to call the Episcopal Church to recapture what had been lost for many, and that was a vital, personal, even intimate relationship with God in a way that was life-changing and really miraculous. However, charismatic renewal's downfall was defining renewal and limiting it to personal spiritual experience. 
As a result, if you had the experience that I thought made you authentic, you were in. If you didn't have that experience, well, I'm really sorry. Where is your lack of faith? American charismatic renewal, as opposed to global Pentecostalism, had very little in the way of a missionary vision. But in Luke Acts, empowerment for ministry included saying yes to being in the flow of what God is doing. God's definition of God's mission. Seeing the world as a planet, planet packed with angels, archangels, and all the company of heaven. Empowerment for ministry is not limited to spiritual experiences. Empowerment of, for ministry is saying yes to being God's servant and out of that allowing him to flow through you as he chooses, not as you would like. I, let me tell a small story out of that earlier era. I was with a small group of young adults. I was 25, 26 at the time, newly ordained priest serving at All Saints Winter Park. And I was part of a small singles group, Christians that met at St. Michael's in Orlando. And we were having this conversation about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. After it was over, a woman came up to me and I had somebody with me that was just available to pray for me. And she, deeply troubled, said, I, I don't know that I can do this. I prayed for God to change my life and literally nothing has happened. And I feel this tremendous block between me and heaven. And I don't know why I said it. Hopefully it was the inspiration of God. But I said to her, have you ever made fun of Pentecostals and Charismatics? Oh, her whole face changed. Oh, yes. And she went into this actually very biting and hysterically funny sort of um, caricature of people who acted like that. And I said, are you willing to be one of them if that's what God asks of you? And it was one of those, yeah. And she had to stop and really count the cost and think about that because the greatest fear in her life was appearing foolish. Not being like her other Christian friends in some way. Her other Christian friends. But after a while she said, okay. And a friend of mine and I prayed for her. And out of her mouth poured the most beautiful prayer language you've ever heard changed her life on the spot. You see, so long as I understand the empowerment of the Holy Spirit is something that I get to define, that's not slavery. That's me picking and choosing what I want from God. And while sometimes God is gracious enough to accommodate our wishes, it could even be that we are the losers, even though we were granted the thing that we were asked for. Can we get a little bigger than that? Like right now. What are the things that are challenging the church? Thank you, Esau Makali. It certainly is the issue of dealing with racism. It is huge in our culture. It's not going away. So... Can we think about how to challenge that, for example, not only is the fruit of sinful human prejudice evidenced in assumptions about personhood and social patterns of relating based on those often false assumptions about personhood, but can we not only challenge those sinful assumptions and as a church intentionally, intentionally live out a pattern of relating, hiring, that would allow us to look more like the kingdom? every tribe, tongue, people, language, and nation, rather than a club for people who look like we do, but also see those patterns as the work of demonic principalities and powers, causing us as we step into this place of reconciliation with prayer and fasting, as was recommended to us, that those powers would be broken and that new life would bring forth into move into the life of our community. You see, when we want to think about something like that, what we are quick to do is borrow the political rhetoric around that particular issue, rather, and thank you for challenging us, thinking theologically about what is at stake and what's actually going on. 
the same, for example, as we think about financial and ecological stewardship, particularly as an antidote to sinful human greed, but also making commitments in finances that would wind up being a prayerful and intercessory assault on the devil who continues to insist that the glory of the kingdom of this world is his to be given to those who worship him. Can our stewardship campaigns be flavored by the understanding that when we give to God's work, those tithes and offerings are our stake in the ground. Our declaration that by those tithes, we are saying no to this devil who would tempt us to spend all of our money on our own pursuits and that God's work is greater than my own selfish desire for financial security. Have we so little trust in God's supernatural ability to provide or do we not want God to challenge both our personal and our ecclesiastical financial rights to spend the money as we want? Can you not see that the very issues with which we wrestle with at the deepest level, and I, I could go on, always when they reflect sinful patterns that bind us, from being obedient to the thing the scripture teaches is not just an issue of my own brokenness, although it certainly is that, but it is also how I am literally played by demonic powers to continue that reign, even though it is in contradiction to the reign of God that I declare with all of my heart. In other words, to live a life empowered by the Spirit of God is not to somehow try to duplicate some personal heightened spiritual experience that causes me to feel better than, uh, about myself, and as a result, I've experienced my own Pentecost, and I'm the better for it. It's incredibly truncated and untrue to the Luke Acts reading where people empowered by the Spirit of God formed communities, gave up what they had, laid down their life for the mission of God, and caused even pagans to say, these are they that turn the world upside down. So long as my understanding of the work of the Holy Spirit allows me merely to just do a better job of fitting into my own preconceived parameters, whether that be about finances or about churchmanship or about stewardship or citizenship, I'm really missing the boat and I'm actually saying yes to idols that would in fact love to keep me in their sway, even as I sing Jesus is Lord. And it has everything to do with our inability to see the poverty of our condition and to cry out to God to do a work in us that we cannot do for ourselves to gather in our own places of the upper room and ask God to pour out upon us a Pentecostal spirit that in fact sets us free. That's what we prayed in the collect. That the continuation of the love and healing ministry of the Son of God would be manifested in our midst. So believe me, as I've been wrestling with this, I'm asking God to change me. Change me. It's going to cause me to have conversations about how my wife and I spend our money. It's going to cause me to try to think differently about what it means to be an apostolic bishop. I can't do anything other than that. I believe it is providence that caused this feast day to be the day when we would do the renewal of our ordination vows. So that what we can only say to God is, hopefully, I will, what? With God's help. Just like we say to those who are presented for baptism and for confirmation. Because the promises are too high and too great for us to say anything other than that. And to allow to know, to know with real joy that as we come, even when it is half-hearted, which most of us do, to that kind of transforming work, 
God does take the seeds that are offered to him and plant sometimes great and mighty plants in the midst of our weaknesses, even when we don't know what we're asking for. So, beloved, in your community, in your parish, what is the spiritual condition like? Asking God to show you how he sees your city, your community, your parish. And ask God to work in you and your parish such great mercies that the love and healing power of the Son of God would, in fact, be manifested. Why? That Jesus might be glorified always and that the world might believe. Amen. Amen.